In addition to his talents as an illustrator, Apel Les Mestres was a highly successful musical composer, author and poet, and yet for most of us now he languishes in the darker recesses of cultural memory. He was born in Barcelona in Catalonia in northeastern Spain in 1854, the son of a prominent architect, and in his teens he travelled widely throughout Europe. He studied art at Barcelona's Escola de la Llotja, and in 1875 he published the first of what would be several books of poems. From 1877 onward he had illustrations and cartoons published regularly in several Catalan newspapers and magazines, and having made a solid reputation in his own province, he went on to create many more images for a number of well-regarded Spanish magazines. Two years later, in 1879, he published a colour edition of Don Quixote, based on his watercolour originals, and although the Cromwell lithographic printing was far from a runaway success, the underlying images were both highly imaginative and well considered, and it proved to be a popular edition in Spain at least. In 1882, he published a collection of his writing and humorous line illustrations in two volumes collectively titled Cuentos Vivos, which brought him more popular success. And in 1884, he published a visualization of the Dance of Death with a series of broadly comic quasi-medieval cartoons. In the same year, he began an elaborate series of journals and sketchbooks featuring watercolor and line drawings titled Libre Vert. But the tragedy of this body of work is that when it was created, there was no way to reproduce it with any success as full color lithography was still some years distant. Nevertheless, enough of this precious collection has survived and I'm able at least to show some examples from it. In 1885, Les Mestres married, but it seems that around this time he was more active as a writer and composer, and it wasn't until the turn of the century that his pen and ink drawings were regularly published in Blanco y Negro magazine. He also became a popular choice to create comic postcards, and among others, he created several series where three separate images made up the total picture. But it was in 1907 that he published a book which was undoubtedly one of the greatest achievements of his career. This was his visualization of the fantasy poem Liliana, and it contained an abundance of evocative pen and ink drawings, which combined folk and fairy tale elements using both humor and romance with equal dexterity. Unlike his earlier work, these images were not printed from engravings, and consequently they were absolutely faithful reproductions of his original pen and ink drawings. The book remains a largely forgotten but important fantasy illustration masterpiece. Sadly, throughout his adult life, Les Mestres had suffered persistently poor health, which resulted in his doctor insisting that he should be confined to his home for some 14 years, and whatever its other benefits, this confinement didn't do much for his mental well-being by all accounts. And by 1912, his deteriorating vision, almost certainly caused by cataracts, forced him to stop working altogether. A few years later, he did publish some songs which became popular in the region, but in 1915, just to add to his misery, his wife Laura died. And in 1936, just after the start of the Civil War, Apple Les Mestres died at the age of 81. I have no idea why, but French illustrator and poster artist Henri Thirier also used the more English-sounding Henry with a Y, which led to some unwanted confusion in my research. He was born in 1873 in Epinal in eastern France, and that's pretty much that for biography. It seems he didn't have any formal art education and from 1890, when he would have been 17, he started work at a lithographic print shop in Paris, where he learnt the print process and how to work successfully with it in his illustrated work. Before long, he had become an invaluable resource for the company and he created a large number of advertising posters which they printed and distributed around the country. Naturally enough, for the time, all his posters displayed a particularly strong Art Nouveau influence, with the use of attractive female characters and flowing organic graphic support. Among many other cultural and technological developments of this historical period was the spectacular growth in popularity of the humble bicycle. In 
and consequently many of Thierry's posters were promoting that form of transport, and usually in quite fanciful ways, with allusions to fantasy and romance in the settings created. But alongside his success in posters, even by the turn of the century, he was getting involved in other areas of expression, such as book and postcard work, and also had some success as a painter. But during the first decade of the century, he stopped creating posters in favour of book illustration, and simultaneously abandoned the graphic principles of Art Nouveau. In 1908, The Prisonnier de la Planète Mars was published, and although not very well printed as tonal monochromes, the illustrations he created for this book showed an obvious talent for visualising the improbable narrative with considerable plausibility. Two years later, Paul Divois's science fiction tale Le Dompteur de l'Or was published with a colour cover and more tonal monochrome page illustrations, which in this book at least were far more clearly printed. Sadly, this wasn't true of 1913's gloriously over-the-top story La Guerre des Vampires, and hot on the heels of this book's publication, France found themselves at war with Germany from 1914 to 1918. And it was only when it ended that he returned to the illustration of popular novels with pen and ink drawings for 1920's The Crumbs of Glory, written by Emile Pesch. In 1925 he became the city councillor and deputy mayor of the town of Cretil, but didn't abandon illustration, and in the mid-1920s he created a number of duotone watercolour cover illustrations for a series of popular adventure stories written by various French writers for the Jules Talandier publishing house. But more significantly in 1930 his colour illustrations for a new edition of Perrault's Fairy Tales was published and it was a great success. This wasn't surprising as the quality of these brightly coloured pen and wash illustrations perfectly captured the essence and period charm of Perrault's fanciful stories, many of which would later be adapted by and credited to others including the brothers Grimm and Hans Andersen. I found nothing produced later than this, but if this was in fact his last major work, it was a fitting end to a significant and diverse illustration career. And Henri Thierrier died in Cretier in 1946 at the age of 73. Wallace Morgan was born in New York City in 1875, but not long after his birth, the whole family moved to Albany. It seems he was clear in his ambitions from an early age, and as soon as he had finished high school, he returned to the city and took tuition at the National Academy of Design, whilst also working part time at the New York Sun. In 1898, when he was 23 years old, he took a full-time job with the New York Herald as a journalistic illustrator. The nature of this work honed his ability to work fast and accurately. In 1907, Morgan illustrated the comic strip Fluffy Ruffles, with verses written originally by Caroline Wells, although only a year later she was replaced by Charles Loomis. It became immensely popular and led to the publication of books made up from the series of newspaper features they'd created. This was a remarkable piece of work not only because of the expressive qualities and visual engagement of his gestural brush and pen drawings. Although this was not a book for children, it was effectively a picture book and the visual element was easily the dominant aspect of the book and highly unusual for the time. But despite his full-time job with the Herald, Morgan was also working for others, including Life, for whom he created some frivolous colour work. In 1908, Morgan illustrated the book Cy Whitaker's Place, written by Joseph C. Lincoln, with a large volume of remarkably evocative pen and inks. And he was prolific as a book illustrator in this period, with many more highly descriptive monochromes for others, including Rosner by Myra Kelly, and two for the author Richard Harding Davis, with 1912's Red Cross Girl and The Lost Road published a year later. Not long after, Collier's magazine sent him on a mission to tour the USA with the writer Julian Street. This task kept him creatively occupied for several years, and as well as the magazine articles, their accounts of their travels spawned two popular books, which were published in 1914. When America joined the Allies to fight in World War I, Morgan put his ability to sketch quickly to good use, with a series of expressive visual descriptions of combat with an immediacy lacking in photography at the time. 
and they formed an exceptionally immersive historical record of the conflict. After the war, Morgan returned to work in his studio in New York City and illustrated Ring Lardner's comical account, My Four Weeks in France, with a series of graphite and charcoal illustrations possessed of considerable comic energy. Throughout the 1920s and into the 30s, he remained a ubiquitous presence in books and increasingly featured in popular magazines. And although his undoubted strength was in his ability as a linear illustrator, there were also a few of his illustrations published using overlaid washes of bright loosely applied watercolour, including the book We Owed It to the Children, written by Grace Roosevelt and published in 1935. And following a 40-year career in illustration, Wallace Morgan died at home of a heart attack in 1948, when he was 73 years old. British designer and illustrator Dora Batty was born in Colchester, Essex in 1891, the youngest of three daughters of the Reverend Thomas Batty and his wife. She later attended Chelmsford School of Science and Art, but unfortunately the earliest example of her work I've been able to find is the first poster she designed for London Transport in 1921, by which time she would have already been 30 years old. Many more commissions from London Transport followed throughout the decade, all of which fell broadly into line with the Art Deco style popular in Britain at the time. Batty displayed a keen sense of aesthetic balance and particularly effective use of limited palettes of flat colour in the images she produced. She also found time to create line-only illustrations for a trio of books of poetry written by W. H. Davis between 1925 and 1927. Nevertheless, London Transport continued to be her principal client, and by this point she had become one of the company's most frequently commissioned poster designers, with a series of particularly striking images which successfully combined the sensibility and languid grace of fashion illustration with a natural flair for floral decoration. Around the turn of the decade, she also created some show cards for a shoe manufacturer and enjoyed considerable success as both a textile designer and a ceramic designer for a range of major companies in Britain. From 1932, Batty also taught textile design at the Central School of Arts and Crafts, but continued to work in all her creative endeavours simultaneously and she was prolific in her creation of transport-related posters throughout the decade up to the outbreak of war in 1939, at which point her output slowed considerably and other than a couple of fairly minor commissions, the last dated example of illustration work I've been able to find is 1944's The Giant Without a Heart, an old Norse fairy tale for which she produced a series of figure-based narrative images but she continued in her role as an academic and created textile designs up to her retirement in 1958, and Dora Batty died in Essex at the age of 75 in 1966. Which brings us to the end of this one, and I hope to see you again when the next one is uploaded.